You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we are joined by Tim Kakir, a serial entrepreneur. Tim is a growth consultant who helps companies, entrepreneurs, and students achieve fast and consistent growth. Working with 17 startups to date, some of his best achievements include helping two startups achieve 1.7 million euro in Horizon 2020 funding and increasing the MRR of one startup from 80K to 300K in less than 18 months, completing projects such as implementation of OKRs and building company dashboards, rebranding and product launches. Tim, you're very welcome to the show. Hi, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. Delighted to have you. That is some uh, bio, if I will call it that. Impressive. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to jumping into that. Usually I don't read out the bio of the guest beforehand, but yours was just there in easy copy paste. That's just a little um, summary, but yeah, things yeah. are right. <laughs> um, First question I'd like to start with is, where are you born? Wow, I was born in Istanbul, Turkey. Wow, fascinating. I've flown into Istanbul. I've spent a couple, a couple of months in Alanya. Wow. Um, okay. Every now and then, my girlfriend's parents have a house over that, so every summer we try to go over for, for a couple of days. Well, she goes over for a while. I, I don't like to go to the same place. I go to different places all the time, but I will visit Turkey every now and again. Um, did you grow up there, or did you move well, around? Yeah, uh, I lived uh, my first 15 years of my life in Istanbul. My dad's Turkish, obviously, and my mom's French. So then I moved, I mean, so then I didn't move to France, but I moved to Seattle for a year, then six years in Los Angeles, eight years in London, four years in Barcelona. And now it's been a year. I'm just outside Barcelona, just by the beach. Wow. So what were the first 15 years like in Turkey? Any fond favorite memories? Uh, Yeah, amazing memories. I remember back then, you know, like things were like, you know, we didn't have smartphones and, and all that. So you could do kind of whatever you wanted. Like, I, it's not nice to say, but I used to drive without a license. Nice. <laughs> you know, police couldn't stop you and do anything about it. You know, it's weird times. I'm not very proud of it, but, uh, you know, um, it was a nice way to, to grow up. I think, uh, you know, I did uh, some extreme stuff that I think that uh, kids today couldn't do it. When you were growing up from all the different places you spent time in, if you focus on the first kind of 20 years of your life, or even younger than that, the first, yeah, 18 years, who do you think inspired you the most, had a massive impact on who you, you become today? Well, to be honest, like I'm going to, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but it's going to be my dad. All right? My dad was a businessman and uh, he grew a few companies. He had uh, 300, 400, maybe more uh, employees. Um, but it was a very old school business. Like he did um, port management, international port management. So emptying container ships, or emptying uh, big ships, basically. And uh, one thing that he told me, and, and that still stays, actually now it gets even more engraved in my mind, it's don't do something to someone that you wouldn't uh, need to be done to you. And that's how I try to live now. And I just got a baby, a uh, three months old baby. So I, I'd love to, yeah. to say thank you. I'd love to also um, teach that, right? That's, that's kind of now what I'm, uh, I'm trying to preach to my kid. I like that. That was one of my next questions around. Is there something that you learned from your parents that you kind of held on to, to this day? But you've already answered that. So I'd like to jump into the next section of the podcast. Personal brand. Yep. You've got an interesting one. And by interesting, I mean, it's a good one. You, you've put a lot of time and, and effort in, into building your personal brand. And uh, you're good on camera. Not a lot of people are good on camera. Um, <laughs> but a couple of questions around that. And it's not that I'm skeptical of personal branding. I'm, I'm sitting on, on, on the other side of the fence and kind of someone who hasn't built a personal brand, I'm asking questions from their point of view. So I'm not disagreeing with you here, uh, but why might someone build, work on building their personal brand? And I say that with founders, CEOs, and MDs across the UK and Ireland in high potential startups to listen to this podcast. And a lot of them would go, I could spend some time building my personal brand, or I could you know, manage my employees and focus on bottom line revenue. Mm -hmm. So why, why, put some time into building your personal brand? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think this started when I moved to Spain. Since I lived eight years in England, uh, I, I had quite a bit of a network, you know, and back then it was like meetup events offline and so on. And when I moved to Barcelona, I realized I didn't know anyone in the industry. Like uh, a job brought me here uh, and I, I didn't know many people. So, so I focused on actually automating LinkedIn. So, so I did spend some time, but um, I'm quite the automation crazy guy. Uh, so, so, so I've done a bit of automation on LinkedIn. So I, it didn't take me that much time. But uh, I remember once sending 3000 people a message for Christmas, like Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, how can I help you? Um, in automation in Barcelona to like CMOs, CEOs, that was the network I wanted to have. 
uh, and about 300 of them answered. And I remember that I had to do the manual work and, and, and chat to them all one by one. That took the time. But building that first 3000 message uh, to people didn't take me much time. Um, and so um, I think that I always say to my students, because I also teach, um, you know, build your network or build your brand when you don't need it, right? Because one day you're going to need it. And if then you try to build it, it's going to be a bit too late because you're going to want something from people. And that's not that's going to look very salesy. But if you build it before, years before, so I built it five years ago, right? When I came to Spain, I really focused on this digital brand and LinkedIn and, and all that. And and now, you know, um, you know, the fruits of it are starting to, to, to come into play. I, I always say that if you focus on building your brand, depending on the route you choose to do, podcast, content, whatever you do, it helps you build deeper relationships and connections with people. And you can leverage those connections to open other doors. For example, I've had, you're probably guest number 140 at like episode like 80. I contacted all my previous guests because I was doing some research for another project and I dropped him a message and I was like, you know, here are kind of the five most common reasons the CEOs of today do what they do. Uh, they want to have a positive impact. They're, 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 they're looking to kind of scale so they can exit a couple of other different things. I said, I'm kind of curious, can you circle the ones that impact that matter to you the most? Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't have had those people on my podcast and kind of built the relationship and managed that relationship actively, I don't think any of them would have responded to me. And out of the 80, I probably got about 70 responding, which is exceptionally high. Um, but that, so by building my personal brand, I was able to gather data. Uh, and that's just one example, but this is, podcast is not about me. This is about you. Um, and some people might be starting from scratch. So how can someone start? Uh, oof, there's so many ways, as you said, there's podcasts, there's newsletters, just share it. Even on LinkedIn, we don't do this enough, but just share a sentence of what you're, you're thinking that day, right? Uh, people want to know what others are thinking and we want to start a conversation. So you have to start the conversation yourself. And, you know, like people, you can't wait for people to come to you. So I really recommend just go on LinkedIn or if, if you're going to do a professional network, obviously LinkedIn is the place. I'm not saying it's the best place, but mm. it is the place at the moment for professional networking. Uh, just, just say what you think, you know, on a Friday, even do a short video of how your week was and what you learned from it. Uh, I think these kind of things work. But to what you just said about um, your podcast about, and about the CEOs, I, I made so many good connections and even friends from my newsletter, right? I started to send this newsletter about 52 episodes ago, 54 or something like that. Um, so last year it's a weekly newsletter um, and people start joining it that I didn't know and they start answering. And I do talk about some, some personal things there as well. Like I had my baby, I've learned from this, I learned from that in, in my normal personal life as well. And people really reply and they say, oh wow, thank you for being honest. And we start conversation with these people and they became, some of them are my friends now. Interesting and a great insight. Um, I was at the uh, Aviva Stadium in Ireland last night, football stadium, Ireland playing against Qatar in a friendly match. And when I was driving home, um, I was thinking of this podcast that I had today and it was around, you know, building your personal brand and there's the question of how can someone start and people, when I researched this, people were always saying, you know, be yourself. And I was talking to myself in the car, in my head, not out loud. And uh, I was saying, I don't know, like there's several different versions of me. My mother sees a different version that my best friend would see. She might go, holy crap, that's not the version of Rena I know if she saw what me and my best friend do. My girlfriend sees a different version. So when you say be yourself, I, 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 I'm assuming what you mean, and I'm, I've heard, I've seen you reference this in an article as well. I'm assuming you, what you mean by that is be the right version of yourself to the people that you're trying to get the attention of. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, I think that I don't even think about it when I do that automatically. I think we all have, as you said, with my mother, I'm different because that's family, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with my partner, I'm different because that's my partner. Right. And, and we are, you know, we have this kid now and it's much more personal and so on. And, and with the people that I do business with or that I, I speak to online, right. I'm automatically very different. I don't think that we really have to think about it so much, you know, cause, cause if we start thinking about these things and we try to, you know, uh, is is my voice perfect? Is my speech perfect? Is my content perfect? Then we never do anything, right? And then we just get It's not even that out. though. It's it's more so some people say they want to be the ultimate version of themselves, both in work and outside of work. And they do things that aren't necessarily incredibly professional, but then they'll answer it with, I'm just being myself. And it's like, there's a fine line between like, you know, 
um, what you do in work and what you do outside of work. And some of that can cross over, but some of that you kind of got to leave at home because the objective at the end of the day is, well, for some people to to grow bottom line revenue, for other people to manage employees. I don't know. So that's kind of where I was going. It wasn't more yeah. so. No, yeah. I mean, I think rule number one, don't be an asshole, first of all, <laughs> and do whatever you want. Uh, that's how I see it. But, um, yeah. you know, like from, from personal to, to professional, like, I have this baby, right? And I and and I and I always say about experimentation, right? Because so, I'm a growth consultant, so let's experiment in companies and, and and so on. And in my newsletter, I spoke about how I experiment with my baby because I've never been a father, so I'm learning about it and how experimentation works with my baby. Just to be careful, because you have a lot that you can lose, because it's not just a business experiment; it's actually a human being, right? And, and that it was a very like interesting personal experience to professional experience that I was more than happy to share out loud. I mean. I don't know, but I don't have this. Um, I'm not trying to be secret on my personal life. Like I don't say, okay, this is me personal and this is me professional. I am who I am. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work with some people. And yeah. sometimes it work with some people. If it doesn't work with those people, they don't have to be my friend. They don't have to follow my network, my content. I don't have to do business with them. It's okay. There's so many, there's 8 billion people out there that we can do things with. You've, uh, I like it. You've, uh, talked about automation. You've been involved in marketing, uh, COO, CMO, chief growth officer roles. So I'm sure you've come across the topic of attribution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where, you know, leads are attributed to. So you take a standard like CMS or sorry, CRM, uh, mm -hmm. like HubSpot or something, yep. and it will tell you uh, this lead came from, uh, you know, paid uh seo this lead came from a linkedin download this came from this but sometimes when i look into that like let's say seo or organic search that might have come from someone's friend said hey listen to this podcast someone listened to the podcast then a couple of days later they were like shit i still have that problem i'm gonna google it but then the crm says it came from organic search but it actually came from word of mouth so is there a, when you think of attribution how do you think that companies, when they look at where their leads came from, because sometimes their lead, although they technically came from there, they didn't really come from there. How do they kind of uh, better identify what not to switch off? Because if they were to go, we got to put everything in the SEO now because organic search is working and turn off the podcast. Well, in fact, it was probably the podcast that was working more than the SEO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've, I've I've came across this problem in many, many companies, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, B2B SaaS companies that I've consulted for. They're like, oh, especially they get like a paid ads expert that is external to the company. So he he gets charged, like he charges per lead or, you know, uh, he has a goal. Uh, and uh, the content team says, no, but they read this first or they saw that first and then they came with the ad or they clicked on the ad. So this this first touch, last touch, multi-touch, all these kind of things are, are, are some crazy things. But I think that that's changing a lot now. And um, we can't look at first touch, what you're mentioning, the, the original source could be that first touch. But then we need to see also on that multi-touch, right? Okay, they've came from an ad, but they didn't convert neither, right? Then they've seen a SEO, a, a content piece, and then suddenly, yeah, by uh, SEO, suddenly something came in front of them again. So they remember our company in two weeks again, right? So we have to be able to, I think, give a percentage to all this, right? Okay, we can say the first touch for us is a, is a 60% or a 50%. And then you should be able to give certain um, weight to other touches that uh, that this lead is doing. This is complex, to be honest with you. And this is why Google Analytics is even changing uh, how they attribute things, right? So so now the GA4, is, it's event-based and so on. We're building funnels and we're trying to understand what converts a user and not just where we get the user. Because getting the user is great, but I don't think we should look at just the entry point, we have to really mm. look at that whole journey. You know, how do we show them our value and how do they buy it? And then how do they see that value? And then how do they become, as you said, this evangelist where they go talk to other people, right? And and this is where I think a lot of marketeers get stuck because because we only think about acquisition marketing and we don't we don't think about the rest, the activation, the retention, the re, you know, the revenue referral uh, and so on. And uh, even this funnel that I just mentioned, I think even that's starting to to be very blurred because as you mentioned on your podcast, maybe I'm going to tell somebody else and they're going to come in and they're going to be a guest or they're going to be a listener, right? So, so we're trying to build more loops, right? By giving value. If you give value, somebody will talk about the value that they got. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so things are getting even more complex, but, but we can very simplify it very much. So, and, and I think the simplification is this, do you solve a problem 
if you solve a problem, how can you show that to people who has that problem? Yeah. And that's it. If we think about that, then we don't think about just the source where they come in and so on. Yes, the budget of the marketing is super important, but you know, it's again, if, if you do think something is coming from somewhere else and you thought it's SEO, just experiment with it and compare those experiments and see what's happening. You know, have a lot of questions and try to answer these questions every day. I like it. I guess when you mentioned buyer's journey, then ultimately the way I interpret that is just how can you move people from that, like, and they become aware of you to then making the, the to then considering you to then making the decision and like a, like a multi-touch approach, but not kind of limiting to one loop as, as, as you said. In a podcast, sorry, somebody told me something very interesting. I love it. It's we don't buy products. Uh, what, what did he say? He said we rent outcomes. Right. Because because now we're in the SaaS world. Right. So we pay a subscription. We're renting that outcome. If we get rid of that, we don't have that outcome anymore or we're renting that value. Right. So we're not buying products anymore. So that's how we have to yeah. think. You know, you bring a user, uh, you know, I don't like to call them user because that's like, you know, it sounds really bad. And um, social dilemma was really bad. That is, you know, Netflix and users, users, but <laughs> our customer, let's say, or the people that we really give value to, we can't just bring them to the product and be like, all right, that's it. You're in and let's forget about you. Right. They have a lifetime and that lifetime, we have to make them happy. We have so many other products that are we, we're competing with at any given industry. Right? There's so much out there now. There's so many tech companies. There's so many even even hardware products. Right. How do you keep giving this value? Right. So don't just focus on the entry point, but also focus on the people that you have inside your company that are your loyal customers. You don't buy products, you rent outcomes. That's genius. Yeah, I love it when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to stick with me for a while. There's very few kind of those one-liners that stay, but I'm feeling that one's going to stay. Um, blind spots uh, that can potentially hold back otherwise healthy businesses. Things like not building your bench so that if a key kind of employee leaves, you're screwed or not paying attention to lead development or not onboarding, not hiring but also onboarding is important as well there's 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 tons of potential blind spots that can hold the business back but you've done some lecturing in the geneva business school and you've been involved in a ton of companies mm -hmm. from all your experience what are some of the things that you see that hold businesses back from achieving mm -hmm. more bottom line revenue than they're currently at well i i I'd like to add a couple of things to that. First of Please. all, I, uh, there was a conversation as well. It was a CEO and a CFO. And the CEO says, hey, we need to put some money onto, onto you know, training and learning education for our employees. And, and the CFO says, no, why? Like, you know, that's a lot of money. What if they leave? Right? And the CEO says, and the CEO says what, what if they stay? You know, what if they stay? What if they don't evolve? What if they don't grow and they stay? That's even worse. So we have to spend that money, right? So, so I think companies are sometimes stuck. They're like, oh, you know, self-development. We don't care that much. This is your this is your job. This is what you're going to do. You're just going to sell. No, you have to develop them. They have other options. They can go to other companies. Other companies, recruiters will come, give better salaries, better, um, you know, um, insurance plans and so on and, and and people will leave so so that's one for sure but i think the the biggest mistake that we do that i've seen is our goal setting is really wrong right we set goals from top to bottom and we say all right this is the goal of the company go execute and, and then and then team members are like okay you're the executive level do you do the day-to-day -day job that i do no all right so how do you really decide on a, just a monetary goal you know, let's not decide on making 100,000 uh, ARR or MRR, but let's decide on making 10,000 customers happy, right? Because then if you don't think about just the money, you're thinking about different techniques of making these customers happy and the money will come, right? Mm -hmm. And also when we do goal setting or, you know, we want to go somewhere, right? This is where the CEO wants to go. Don't tell them how we're going to get there. Ask your team members on how do they think we could get there? Right. The, the answers you'll hear are life changing. Are they're, they're changing businesses, right? Ideation sessions, you know, collective intelligence is something that I'm starting to preach a lot. And, and you'll hear next year, hopefully I'm, uh, I'm going to finish a book about how we can nice. tap into collective intelligence and how in businesses we don't do this, this enough. We hire the best people. We spend a lot of money, a lot of salary on them. Um, and we just put them in a box and we say, all right, this is where you are. This is what you do. This is your job description and this is the processes. Maybe that person that we hired could really optimize those. Maybe they'd have a better idea on how to get to those goals that we're thinking that are our goals. So, so let's listen to each other a bit more. Let, let's try to flatten some of the hierarchy as well. Um, and I think that starts to grow businesses, you know, uh, in a sustainable way. 
you spent some time at Planet of the Vapes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and there was a line that you, I guess, put up online. I found it somewhere and it says, I learned the importance of amazing customer service. I think this was lessons from Planet of the Vape. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the company is dedicated to customer success and values customer satisfaction above immediate profit. I'd like to carry this vision on to other companies I work for in the future. So the question can you give me an idea of what you felt that you did well during your time with Planet of the Vapes mm -hmm. uh, that contributed to the success of that company? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, before I'll say how I learned that concept, because I remember, uh, I remember, um, and you've done a great research. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, so, so I was at Planet of the Vapes and, and we had this, uh, this, this kind of crisis management moment, right? Um, and it, it's an interesting story. It was uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, we did a donation. Um, we did a quite a substantive donation to Black Lives Matter. We chose a couple of charities that, that you know, uh, especially it's a vape company for cannabis industry, right? A lot of people are in jail because of cannabis and now cannabis is legal, you know, and Crazy. so on. And a lot of white supremacist people are in the biggest heads of biggest cannabis companies and so on. So, so we wanted to help, you know, um, and I remember what happened is that we had a percentage of our customers who, who actually sadly were racist. Right. So, so they started to create tickets of, and, and, and commenting on places of how, how they didn't agree with us and how we were blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't even want to use some of these words. They were horrible words. And, and I remember is, um, you know, it was our operations director called me up. I was the CGO, the chief growth officer. Um, and I, he said, Hey Tim, we have a crisis. You know, we're getting these tickets. We're getting these reviews everywhere. And I was like, <clears throat> Okay, let me call up the CEO. The CEO Patrick Wynn still. I mean, I've learned so much. Um, um, I've learned so much from it from Patrick. And um, so basically, what Patrick said, he said, he just turned around and 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 he said, guys, do we have their email addresses? We said, yeah. He's like, okay, can we block them from our website? Can we block them from buying? He said, yeah, we can. And we blocked all these people from buying. We said no to this money, right? We didn't want them as a customer because they were not in our mission, vision, values. They were not, they were not in what we believed, right? And and when Patrick said that that day, I, I still remember. I was like, wow. I I really was like, wow. I was almost about to cry. I was like, wow. A CEO, a leader, who who his his business has to make money, right? Um, can say no to money because these people ha doesn't have the same beliefs as us, you know. And and it's really bad beliefs, actually, racism, right? So so I love. I, that was an, an amazing example. And then, you know, the business still grow, but, uh, uh, but uh, going more on the customer support side of things, it's in every meeting, in every kind of decision making, uh, again, this, this is really, I've learned a lot from Patrick, the CEO of uh, Planet of the Vapes. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll promote that all the time because he said to me, he said, not just to me, to, in every meeting, if anybody asked something, he said, what would our users prefer? What would our users want? Right? And we were like, oh, Okay, well, we can answer every question that we had about strategy, about channels, about marketing messaging, and so on, what the users prefer. When you start thinking about the user, I don't like to call the user, but the customer, right? Mm. That then, you know, you will you will evolve so much more. And and on customer support, I remember is you get a vape and you don't like it, right? Uh, but we have a good description about the vape. We have videos about the vape and so on, but you don't like it. People say, hey, I don't like this vape. I made a mistake. We would, we would take it right away. We would refund the whole thing. We'll send them a new vape. We'll do everything needed. Why? Because it's a small percentage of people will do that. And if you do that, now what happens? Try to say something bad about Planet of the Vapes on Reddit. Right? You will get attacked by loyal customers saying that you're making a mistake of saying things bad about Planet of the Vapes. Because Planet of the Vapes gives you great customer support. right? And that is building loyalty, building evangelism that that I've never seen into that level because I work usually with B2B companies and not very big B2C companies who has, you know, hundreds of thousands of, mm -hmm. of, of, um, buying, you know, a year. And, and that really changed my life. And, and I, I will keep promoting that, you know, what's one tool that you can't live without. Wow. That's a great question. I'm a, I'm a tool addict, so it's very difficult <laughs> for, um, for me to say that because I love so many tools out there. Uh, right now, one tool that I can't live without if we're, Talk about business side of things. If mm -hmm. I'm running a company, I think you mentioned it. It's HubSpot, right? Because it's your CRM, it's your marketing automation. I think it's one of the tools that it's very hard for a company to live with. But personally, right now, for me, it's Notion. 
Interesting. They've exploded on TikTok recently. There was an article about how they like forex their oh they grow from like eight billion to twenty billion. No, they're 10, 10, 10 billion valuation. Uh yesterday they got two hundred and fifty million investment and they're just a very young startup. If you could add one mandatory subject to it's called secondary school in Ireland. It's like when before college or university, it's like mm-hmm. teenagers from like 11 to like 18 years old, that period of their life. If you could add a mandatory subject to the curriculum, what would it be and why? Can I create a subject for this? Absolutely. <laughs> I think like being a decent human, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like if we could add that, I think that would be amazing, you know, like uh, teaching for kids to be polite again, you know, and, and I mean, I think that we were just in that in that mid of losing that, but I think the kids now, thanks to TikTok as well as what we mentioned and things, they forget about um, some of, some of the most important values in life. That's a good addition. It hasn't been said before. Usually, I get coding, <laughs> finance, business. Um, yeah, I've had a couple of unique ones, and that's certainly up there as one of the unique ones. So appreciate it that you didn't give a <laughs> generic answer. Um, Tim, it's been an absolute spe- pleasure spending the last 30, 35 minutes with you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted I said yes when your your agency got in contact for you to come on the show. And I've thoroughly enjoyed spending a couple of hours doing research to come up with questions and, you know, making it conversational at the same time. So I'll leave links to everything we've mentioned. And if you want me to leave links to anything else, just drop me an email and I'll put them in the thing where the people are watching or listening to this. If you're watching it and you notice the Tim changed location, uh, Tim, that's because there's some router problem. Yeah, well, Netgear, the firmware update, really bad customer support without testing, actually product development without testing, and amazing routers that we had for 10 months, suddenly they become shit, and everybody's hoping for a new update, but they're not listening to their customers. So so this is uh, a message to Netgear from here as well, actually. <laughs> well, we'll tag Netgear and tell them to get their shit together. <laughs> really, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for dealing with this uh, router problem. Uh, I think it's been a great conversation, uh, an amazing question. Thank you so much for the research.